Chapter Thirty One of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty One. A gag. At a certain point between Basel and Schaffhausen, the Rhine, after winding in wide curves through low green meadows fringed with poplars, suddenly finds itself contracted to a narrow and precipitous channel, down which it foams with a continuous musical roar on the rocks forming this channel connected by a quaint old bridge stand the twin towns gross and klein laufingen of the two there can be no question which has the superior dignity for while clown laufingen which belongs to baden is all comprised of a single narrow street ending in a massive gatehouse gross laufingen which stands in swiss territory boasts at least two streets and a half besides the advantages of a public platz that can scarcely be smaller than an average london back garden a church with a handsome cupola and blue and gold-faced clock and the ruins of what was once an austrian stronghold crowning the hill around which the roofs are clustered with a withered tree on the ragged top of its solitary tall grey tower grosslaufingen has seen more stirring times than at present it was a thriving post-town once a halting-place for all the diligences napoleon passed through it too on his way to moscow and on the roof of an old tower outside the gate is still to be seen a grotesque metal profile riddled with the bullets of french conscripts who made a target of it in sport or insult when a halt was called now the place is sleepy and quiet enough there are no diligences to rattle and lumber over the stones and the most warlike spectacle there is provided by the swiss militiamen as they march in periodically from the neighbouring villages to have their arms inspected singing choruses all the way there is a railway it is true on the klein laufingen bank but a railway where the little station and mouth of the tunnel have been so ornamentally treated that at a slight distance a train coming in irresistibly suggests one of those working models set in motion by either a dropped penny or the fraudulent action of the human breath as conscience permits so innocent an affair is powerless and corrupt laufingen and has brought as yet but few foreigners to its gates english russian and american tourists may perhaps exclaim admiringly as the trains stop affording a momentary view of the little town grouped compactly on the rocks with the blue green cataract rushing by but they are bound for schaffhausen or the black forest or constance and cannot break the journey so the hosts of personally conducted ones pass laufingen by and laufingen seems upon the whole resigned to its obscurity but mark ashburn at least had felt its gentle attractions having come upon it almost by accident as he returned alone from the black forest after the tour with caffin his thoughts were constantly of mabel langton at that time and he found a dreamy pleasure in the idea of coming to laufingen some day when she should be his companion which made him look upon everything he saw merely as a background for her fair face it had seemed a very hopeless dream then and yet a few months more and the dream had come to pass he was at laufingen once again and mabel was by his side the long nightmare of those days before the wedding was over at last he had not dared to feel secure even in the church so strong was his presentiment of evil but nothing had happened the words were spoken which made mabel his own and neither man nor angel intervened and now a week had gone by during which nothing from without had threatened his happiness and for a time as he resolutely shut his eyes to all but the present he had been supremely happy then by degrees the fox revived and began to gnaw once more his soul sickened as he remembered in what a fool's paradise he was living unless holroyd decided to leave england at once with this young gilroy of whom caffin had spoken a stranger he would certainly learn how he had been tricked with regard to mabel's marriage and this would lead him on to the full discovery of his wrongs in his mad determination to win her at all costs mark had disregarded everything but the immediate future if shame and misery were to come upon him he had told himself he would at least have the memory of a period of perfect bliss to console him 
he might lose all else but mabel could not be taken from him but now as she took no pains to hide the content which filled her heart he would scarcely bear to meet her sweet grey eyes for the thought that soon the love he read in them would change to aversion and cold contempt and each dainty caress was charged for him with a ferocious irony he knew at last his miserable selfishness in having linked her lot with his and there were times when in his torture he longed for courage to tell her all and put an end with his own hand to a happiness which was to him the bitterest of delusions but he dared not he had had such marvellous escapes already that he clung to the hope that some miracle might save him yet and this was mark's condition on the morning when this chapter finds him there is a certain retreat which the town would seem to have provided for the express benefit of lovers a rustic arbour on a little mount near the railway station overlooking the rhine fall the surly red-bearded signalman who watched over the striped barrier at the level crossing by the tunnel had understood the case from the first and not altogether from disinterested motives perhaps would hasten to the station as soon as he saw the young couple crossing the bridge and fetched the key of the little wooden gate which kept off all unlicensed intruders it was on this mount that mark stood now with mabel by his side looking down on the scene below spring had only just set in and the stunted acacia trees along the road to the bridge were still bare and had the appearance of distorted candelabra the poplars showed only the mistiest green as yet the elms were leafless and the horse chestnuts had not unfolded a single one of their crumpled claws but the day was warm and bright the sky a faint blue with a few pinkish white clouds shaded with dove colour near the horizon pigeons were fluttering round their lichened piers of the old bridge which cast a broad band of purple on the bright green water and the cuckoo was calling incessantly from the distant woods opposite were the tall houses tinted in faint pink and grey and cream colour with their crazy wooden balconies overhanging the rocks and above the high-pitched brown roofs rose the church and the square tree-crowned ruin behind which was a background of pine-covered hills where the snow still lay amongst the trunks in a silver graining on the dark red soil such life as the little place could boast was in full stir every now and then an ox-cart or a little hooded gig would pass along the bridge and townsmen in brown straw hats would meet halfway with elaborate salutations and linger long to gossip and bareheaded girls with long plaited pigtails present their baskets and bundles to be peered into or prodded suspiciously by the customs officer stationed at the Baden frontier post striped in brilliant crimson and yellow like a giant sugar stick over on the little laufenplatz children were playing about amongst the big iron salmon cages and old people were sitting in the sunshine on the seats by the fountain where from time to time a woman would fill her shining tin pails or a man come to rinse out a tall wooden funnel before strapping it on his back down on the rocks below in a little green cradle swinging over the torrent sat a man busy with his pipe and newspaper which he occasionally left to haul up and examine the big salmon nets by the aid of a complicated rigging of masts and yards at his side how charming it all is said mabel turning her bright face to mark i'm so glad we didn't let ourselves be talked into going anywhere else Mamma thought we were mad to come here so early in the year i think she fancied it was somewhere in the heart of the alps though and i never expected anything like this myself how would you like to stay out here for more than a month mabel all the summer perhaps he asked it would be delightful for some things she said but i think i shall be willing to go back when the end of the month comes mark we must you know our house will be ready for us and then there is your work waiting for you you know you would never write a line here you are so disgracefully idle ah uh, i was only joking he said although his expression was far from jocular we will enjoy all this while we can and when when the end comes we can remember how happy we were when the end of this comes we shall only be beginning to be very happy in another way at home in our own pretty house mark 
I'm not in the least afraid of the future, are you? He drew her slight form towards him and pressed her to his heart, with a fervour in which there was despair as well as love. "'Do you think I could be afraid of any future, so long as you were part of it, my darling?' he said. "'It is only the fear of losing you that comes over me sometimes.' "'You silly boy,' said Mabel, looking up at his overcast face with a little tender laugh. "'I never knew you could be so sentimental. "'I am quite well, and I don't mean to die as long as you want me to take care of you.' He dreaded to lose her by a parting far bitterer than death but he had said too much already, and only smiled sadly to himself at the thought of the ghastly mockery which the memory of her words now might have for him in a day or two. She was daintily rearranging the violets in his buttonhole, and he caught the slender white hands in his, and lifting them to his lips, kissed them with a passionate humility. A little while, perhaps, and those dear hands would never again thrill warm in his grasp as he felt them now. "'I'm afraid,' said Mabel, a little later, "'you're letting yourself be worried still by something. "'Is it the new book? "'Are you getting impatient to hear about it?' "'I did expect some letters before this,' replied Mark. "'He was, indeed, fast growing desperate at Caffin's silence. "'But I dare say everything is going on well.' "'The train from Basel came in just as we got here,' said Mabel. "'See, there is the postman crossing the bridge now.' "'I'm getting anxious too, Mark. "'I can't think why I have had no letters from home lately. "'I hope it is nothing to do with Dolly. "'She was looking quite ill when we went away, "'almost as she did. "'Oh, Mark, if I thought Harold had dared to frighten her again!' "'Mark remembered that afternoon in South Audley Street. "'He had never sought to know why Dolly had gone away so obediently, "'but now he felt a new uneasiness. "'He had never meant her to be frightened.' He would see into it if he ever came home again. "'I don't think he would do such a thing now,' he said, and tried to believe so himself. "'I always thought, you know, Mabel, you were rather hard on him about that affair.' "'I can never change my mind about it,' said Mabel. "'When you are angry, do you never forgive?' asked Mark. "'I could never forgive treachery,' she said. "'Dolly believed every word he said, and he knew it,' and played on her trust in him for some horrible pleasure i suppose he found in it no i can never forgive him for that mark never he turned away with a spasm of conscience if caffin had been a traitor what was he he was roused from a gloomy reverie by mabel's light touch on his arm look mark she cried there is something you wanted to see there's a timber raft coming down the river for within the last few days the Rhine had risen sufficiently to make it possible to send the timber down the stream, instead of by the long and costly transport over land, and as she spoke the compact mass of pine trunks lashed together came slowly round the bend of the river, gradually increasing in pace until it shot to the arch of the bridge and plunged through the boiling white rapids, while the raft broke up with a dull thunder followed by sharp reports as the more slender trunk snapped with the strain. Mark looked on with a sombre fascination, as if the raft typified his life's happiness, till it was all over, and some of the trunks, carried by a cross-current into a little creek, had been pulled in to the shore with long hooks, and the rest had floated on again in placid procession, their scraped, wet edges gleaming in the sunlight. As he turned towards the town again, he saw the porter of their hotel crossing the bridge, with the director's little son, a sturdy, flaxen-haired boy of about four, running by his side. They passed through the covered part of the bridge, and were hidden for an instant, and then turned up the road towards the station. "'They're coming this way,' said Mabel. "'I do believe little Max is bringing me a letter, the darling. I'll run down to the gate and give him a kiss for it.' for the child's stolid shyness had soon given way to Mabel's advances, and now he would run along the hotel corridors after her like a little dog, and his greatest delight was to be allowed to take her letters to her. They were close to the mount now, the porter in his green baize apron and the official flat cap, and little Max in his speckled blue blouse, trotting along to keep up, and waving the envelope he held in his brown fist. 
Mark could see from where he stood that it was not a letter that the child was carrying. "'It's a telegram, Mabel,' he said, disturbed, though there was no particular cause as yet for being so. Mabel instantly concluded the worse. "'I knew it!' she said, and the colour left her cheeks, and she caught at the rough wooden rail for support. "'Dolly is ill. Go down and see what it is. I I'm afraid!' mark ran down to the gate and took the telegram away from little max whose mouth trembled piteously at not being allowed to deliver it in person to the pretty english lady and scarcely waiting to hear the porter's explanation that as he had to come up to the station he had brought the message with him knowing that he would probably find the english couple in their favourite retreat he tore open the envelope as he went up the winding path the first thing that met him was the heading from H. Caffin, Pillar Hotel, Wastwater, and he dared not go on. Something very serious must have happened, since Caffin had sent a telegram. Before he could read further, Mabel came down to meet him. "'It is Dolly, then,' she cried as she saw Mark's face. "'Oh, let us go back at once, Mark. Let us go back.' "'It's not from home,' said Mark. "'It's private. Go up again, Mabel. I will come to you presently.' mabel turned without a word wounded that he should have troubles which she might not share with him when mark read the telegram he could scarcely believe his eyes at first could it be that the miracle had happened for the words rang h of his own accord decided to leave england without further delay started yesterday that could only mean one thing after what caffin had said when they last met Vincent had gone with Gilroy. In India he would be comparatively harmless. It would be even possible now to carry out some scheme by which the book could be restored without scandal. At last the danger was past. He crumpled up the telegram and threw it away, and then sprang up to rejoin Mabel, whose fears vanished as she met his radiant look. "'I hope I didn't frighten you, darling,' he said. "'It was a business telegram about which I was getting anxious.' I was really afraid to read it for a time, but it's all right. It's good news, Mabel. You don't know what a relief it is to me. And now what shall we do? I feel as if I couldn't stay up here any longer. Shall we go and explore the surrounding country? It won't tire you? Mabel was ready to agree to anything in her delight at seeing Mark his old self again, and they went up the narrow street of Klein Laufingen and through the gatehouse out upon the long white tree-bordered main road, from which they struck into a narrow path which led through the woods to the villages scattered here and there on the distant green slopes mark felt an exquisite happiness as they walked on the black veil which clouded the landscape was rent nature had abandoned her irony as he walked through the pine woods and saw the solemn cathedral dimness suddenly chased away as the sunbeams stole down the stately aisles dappling the red trunks with golden patches and lighting the brilliant emeralds of the moss below he almost felt it as intended in delicate allusion to the dissipation of his own gloom mabel was by his side and he need tremble no longer at the thought of resigning the sweet companionship he could listen while she confided her plans and hopes for the future with no inward foreboding that a day would scatter them to the winds his old careless gaiety came back as they sat at lunch together in the long low room of an old village inn while mabel herself forgot her anxiety about dolly and caught the infection of his high spirits they walked back through little groups of low white houses where the air was sweet with the smell of pine and cattle and the men were splitting firewood and women gossiping at the doors and then across the fields where the peasants looked up to mutter a gruffly civil gnabant as they turned the ox-plough at the end of the furrow now and then they came upon one of the large crucifixes common in the district and stopped to examine the curious collection of painted wooden emblems grouped around the central figure or passed a wayside shrine like a large alcove with a woman or child kneeling before the gaudily coloured images but not too absorbed in prayer to cast a glance in the direction of the footsteps the sun had set when they reached the old gatehouse again and saw through its archway 
the narrow little street with its irregular outlines in bold relief against a pale green evening sky i haven't tired you have i said mark as they drew near the striped frontier post at the entrance to the bridge no indeed she said it's been only too delightful why she exclaimed suddenly i thought we were the only english people in laufingen mark surely that's a fellow countryman where said mark the light was beginning to fade a little and at first he saw only a stout little man with important pursed lips trimming the oil lamp which lit up the covered way over the bridge straight in front in the angle there said mabel and even at that distance he recognised the man whose face he had hoped to see no more his back was turned to them just then but mark could not mistake the figure and dress they were vincent holroyd's in one horrible moment the joyous security he had felt only the moment before became a distant memory he stopped short in an agony of irresolution what could he do if he went on and holroyd saw them as he must his first words would tell mabel everything yet he must face him soon there was no escape no other way but across the bridge at least he thought the words which ruined him should not be spoken in his hearing he could not stand by and see mabel's face change as the shameful truth burst upon her mind his nerves were just sufficiently under his control to allow him to invent a hurried pretext for leaving her he had forgotten to buy some tobacco in a shop they had just passed he said he would go back for it now she must walk on slowly and he would overtake her directly and so he turned and left her to meet vincent holroyd alone End of chapter 31chapter thirty two of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two at wastwater in a little private sitting-room of the rambling old whitewashed building half farmhouse half country inn known to tourists as the pillar hotel wastwater holroyd and caffyn were sitting one evening nearly a week after their first arrival in the lake district both were somewhat silent but the silence was not that contented one which comes of a perfect mutual understanding as appeared by the conscious manner in which they endeavoured to break it now and then without much success by this time indeed each was becoming heartily tired of the other and whatever cordiality there had been between them was fast disappearing on a closer acquaintance during the day they kept apart by unspoken consent as Caffin's natural indolence was enough of itself to prevent him from being Vincent's companion in the long mountain walks by which he tried to weary out his aching sense of failure. But at night, as the hotel was empty at that season, they were necessarily thrown together, and found it a difficult infliction. Every day Holroyd determined that he would put an end to it as soon as he could with decency, as a nameless something in Caffin's manner jarred on him more and more, while nothing but policy restrained Caffin himself from provoking an open rupture. And so Holroyd was gazing absently into the fire, where the peat and ling crackled noisily as it fell into fantastic peaks and caves, and Caffin was idly turning over the tattered leaves of a visitor's book, which bore the usual eloquent testimony to the stimulating influence of scenery upon the human intellect, when he came to the last entry in which, while the size of the mountains was mentioned with some approval the saltness of the hotel butter was made the subject of severe comment he shut the book up with a yawn i shall miss the life and stir of all this he observed when i get back to town again holroyd did not appear to have heard him and as caffyn had intended a covert sting the absence of all response did not improve his temper i can't think why the devil they don't send me the paper he went on irritably i ordered it to be sent down here regularly but it never turns up by any chance i should think even you must be getting anxious to know what's become of the world outside this happy valley i can't say i am particularly said holroyd i'm so used to being without papers now ah said caffyn with the slightest of sneers you've got one of those minds which can be converted into pocket kingdoms on an emergency i haven't you know i'm a poor creature and i confess i do like to know who of my friends have been the last to die or burst up or bolt or marry 
just now the last particularly i wonder what's going on in the kitchen eh he added as now and then shouts and laughter came from that direction hello jenny polly whatever your name is he said to the red-cheeked waiting-maid who entered that instant we didn't ring but never mind you just come in to tell us the cause of these unwanted festivities who've you got in the kitchen it's to hounds said the girl hounds is it jolly dogs rather i should say and they're killed near here and they're stooping now postman's come over for a drink with a letter will it be for one o ye and she held out an eccentrically shaped and tinted envelope there's a bonny smell on it she observed it's all right said caffyn it's mine no newspapers eh well perhaps this will do as well and as the door closed upon the maid he tore open the letter with some eagerness from the magnificent miss featherstone i must say there's no stiffness about her style though what should you say when a letter begins like i forgot though he said stopping himself you're the kind of man who gets no love letters to speak of none at all said vincent certainly not to speak of well it's best to keep out of that sort of thing i dare say if you can gilda tells me that she's been officiating as bridesmaid full list of costumes and presents sure it will interest me is she well perhaps she's right do you know holroyd i rather think i shall go in and see how the jovial huntsmen are getting on in there you don't mind my leaving you not in the least said holroyd i shall be very comfortable here i don't quite like leaving you in here with nothing to occupy your powerful mind though and he left the room he came back almost directly however with a copy of some paper in his hand just remembered it as i was shutting the door he said it's only a stale old review i happen to have in my portmanteau but you may not have seen it so i ran up and brought it down for you it's awfully good of you to think of it really said vincent much more cordially than he had spoken of late he had been allowing himself to dislike the other more and more and this slight mark of thoughtfulness gave him a pang of self-reproach well it may amuse you to run through it said caffyn so i got it for you thanks said holroyd without offering to open the paper i'll look at it presently don't make a favour of it you know said caffyn perhaps you prefer something heavier you've mental resources of your own i know but there it is if you care to look at it i'd give anything to see him read it he thought when he went outside but it really wouldn't be safe i don't want him to suspect my share in the business so he went on to the kitchen and was almost instantly on the best of terms with the worthy farmers and innkeepers who had been tracking the fox on foot all day across the mountains vincent shivered as he sat over the fire he had overwalked himself and caught a chill trudging home in the rain that afternoon over the squelching rushy turf of ennerdale and now he was feeling too languid and ill to rouse himself there was a letter that must be written to mabel and he felt himself unequal to attempting it just then and was rather glad than otherwise that the hotel inkstand containing as it did a deposit of black mud and a brace of pre-adamite pens decided the matter for him he took up the review caffyn had so considerably provided for his entertainment and began to turn over the pages more from a sense of obligation than anything else for some time he could not keep his attention upon what he read he had dreamy lapses in which he stood again on the mountain top he had climbed that day and looked down on the ridges of the neighbouring ranges which rose up all around like the curved spines of couching monsters asleep there in the solemn stillness and then he came to himself with a start as the wind moaned along the winding passages of the inn stealthily lifting the latch of the primitive sitting-room door and swelling the carpet in a highly uncanny fashion after one of these recoveries he made some effort to fix his thoughts and presently he found himself reading a passage which had a strangely familiar ring to it he thought at first it was merely that passing impression of a vague sameness in things which would vanish on analysis but as he read on the impression grew stronger at every line he turned to the beginning of the article a notice on a recent book and read it from the beginning to end with eager care was he dreaming still or mad or how was it that in this work with a different title and by a strange writer he seemed to recognize the creation of his own brain he was sure of it 
this book illusion was practically the same in plot and character even in names as the manuscript he had entrusted to mark ashburn and believed a hopeless failure if this was really his book one of his most cherished ambitions had not failed after all it was noticed in a spirit of warm and generous praise the critic wrote of it as having even then obtained a marked success could it be that life had possibilities for him beyond his wildest hopes the excitement of the discovery blinded vincent just then to all matters of detail he was too dazzled to think calmly and only realized that he could not rest until he had found out whether he was deceiving himself or not obviously he could learn nothing where he was and he resolved to go up to town immediately he would see mark there if he was still in london and from him he would probably get information on which he might act for as yet it did not even occur to vincent that his friend could have played a treacherous part should he confide in caffin before he went somehow he felt reluctant to do that he thought that caffin would feel no interest in such things though here as we know he did him an injustice and he decided to tell him no more than might seem absolutely necessary he rang and ordered the dog-cart to take him to drig next day in time to meet the morning train and after packing such things as he would want lay awake for some time in a sleeplessness which was not irksome and then lost himself in dreams of a fantastically brilliant future when caffin had had enough of the huntsman he returned to the sitting-room and was disgusted to find that holroyd had retired and left the review i shall hear all about it to-morrow he said to himself and if he knows nothing i shall have to enlighten him myself but not being an early riser at any time he overslept himself even more than usual next day ignoring occasional noises at his door the consequence being that when he came down to breakfast it was only to find a note from vincent on his plate i find myself obliged to go to town at once on important business he had written i tried to wake you and explain matters but could not make you hear i would not go off in this way if i could help it but i don't suppose you will very much mind caffin felt a keen disappointment for he had been looking forward to the pleasure of observing the way in which vincent would take the discovery but he consoled himself after all it doesn't matter he thought there's only one thing that could start him off like that what he doesn't know he'll pick up as he goes on when he knows all what will he do shouldn't wonder if he went straight for mark somehow i'm rather sorry for that poor devil of a mark he did me a bad turn once but i've really almost forgiven him and but for mabel i think i should have shipped dear vincent off in perfect ignorance dear vincent did bore me so but i want to be quits with charming scornful mabel and when she discovered that she's tied for life to a sham i do think it will make her slightly uncomfortable especially if i can tell her she's indebted to me for it all well in a day or two there will be an excellent performance of the cottage act from the lady of lyon over there and i only wish i could have got a seat for it she'll be magnificent i do pity that miserable beggar upon my soul i do it's some comfort to think that i never did him any harm he lost me mabel and i kept him from losing her i can tell him that if he tries any reproaches meanwhile vincent was spinning along in the dog-cart on his way to drig there had been a fall of snow during the night and the mountains across the lake seemed grander and more awful their rugged points showing sharp and black against the blue tinted snow which lay in the drifts and hollows and their peaks rising in glittering silver against a pale blue sky the air was keen and bracing and his spirits rose as they drove past the grey-green lake and through the plantations of bright young larches and sombre fir he arrived at drigg in good time for the london train and as soon as it stopped at a station of importance seized the opportunity of procuring a copy of illusion one of the earlier editions which he was fortunate enough to find on the bookstall there he began to read it at once with a painful interest for he dreaded lest he had deluded himself in some strange way but he had not read very far before he became convinced that this was indeed his book his very own here and there it was true 
there were passages which he did not remember having written some even so obviously foreign to the whole spirit of the book that he grew hot with anger as he read them but for the most part each line brought back vivid recollections of the very mood and place in which it had been composed and now he observed something which he had not noticed in first reading the review namely that illusion was published by the very firm to which he had sent his own manuscript had not mark given him to understand that chilton and fladgate had rejected it how could he reconcile this and the story that the manuscript had afterwards been accidentally destroyed with the fact of its publication in its present form and why was the title changed who was this cyril ernstone who had dared to interfere with the text the name seemed to be one he had met before in some connection but where had not mark shown him long ago a short article of his own which had been published in some magazine over that or some very similar signature terrible suspicions flashed across him when these and many other similar circumstances occurred to him he fought hard against them however and succeeded in dismissing them as unworthy of himself and his friend he shrank from wronging mark even in thought by believing him capable of such treachery as was implied in these doubts he felt sure of his honour and that he had only to meet him to receive a perfectly satisfactory explanation of his conduct in the matter and then mark and he would hunt down this impostor cyril ernstone together and clear up all that was mysterious enough at present in the meantime he would try to banish it from his mind altogether and dwell only on the new prospects which had opened so suddenly before him and in this he found abundant occupation for the remainder of his journey he reached euston too late to do anything that night and the next morning his first act even before going in search of mark was to drive to kensington park gardens with some faint hope of finding that mabel had returned but the windows were blank and even the front door as he stood there knocking and ringing repeatedly had an air of dust and neglect about it which prepared him for the worst after considerable delay a journeyman plumber unfastened the door and explained that the caretaker had just stepped out while he himself had been employed on a job with the cistern at the back of the house he was not able to give vincent much information the family were all away they might be abroad but he did not know for certain so vincent had to leave with the questions he longed to put unasked at south audley street he was again disappointed the servant there had not been long in the place but knew that mr ashburn the last lodger had gone away for good and had left no address saying he would write or call for his letters holroyd could not be at ease until he had satisfied himself that his friend had been true to him he almost hated himself for feeling any doubt on the subject and yet mark had certainly behaved very strangely in any case he must try to find out who this cyril ernstone might be and he went on to the city and called messrs chilton and fladgate's offices with that intention mr fladgate himself came down to receive him in the little room in which mark ashburn had once waited you wish to speak to me he began you have published a book called illusion said vincent going straight to the point in his impatience i want to know if you feel at liberty to give me any information as to its author mr fladgate's eyebrows went up and the vertical fold between them deepened information he repeated oh dear me no it is not our practice really but you can put your question of course if you like and i will tell you if we should be justified in answering you he added as he saw nothing offensive in his visitor's manner thank you said vincent i will then would you be justified in telling me if the name of cyril ernstone is a real or assumed one a few days ago i should have said certainly not as it is i presume you are anxious to meet mr ernstone i am said vincent very much so ah uh, just so well it happens that you need not have given yourself the trouble to come here to ask that question as you are here however i can gratify your curiosity without the slightest breach of confidence there is our later edition of the book on that table the title page will tell you all you want to know 
Vincent's hand trembled as he took the book. Then he opened it, and the title page did tell him all. His worst suspicions were more than verified. He had been meanly betrayed by the man he had trusted, the man whom he had thought his dearest friend. The shock stunned him, almost as if it had found him totally unprepared. "'It was Mark, then,' he said only half aloud, as he put the book down again very gently. "'Ah, so you know him,' said Mr. Fladgate, who stood by, smiling. "'He was one of my oldest friends,' replied Vincent, still in a low voice. "'And you suspected him, eh?' continued the publisher, who was not the most observant of men. "'He took some pains to put me off the scent,' said Vincent. "'Yes, he kept his secret very well, didn't he? "'Now, you see, he feels quite safe in declaring himself. "'A very brilliant young man, sir. "'I congratulate you in finding an old friend in him.' "'I am very fortunate, I know,' said Vincent grimly. "'Oh, and it will be a pleasant surprise for him, too,' said Mr. Fladgate. "'Very pleasant on both sides. "'Success hasn't spoilt him in the least. "'You won't find him at all stuck up.' "'No,' agreed Vincent. "'I don't think I shall. "'And now perhaps you will have no objection to give me his present address, "'and then I need trouble you no longer at present.' "'I see. "'You would naturally like to congratulate him.' "'I should like to let him know what I think about it,' said Holroyd. "'Exactly. Well, let me see. I ought to have his address somewhere. I had a letter from him only the other day. Did I put it on my file? No, here it is. Yes. Hotel Rheinfall, Gross Laufingen, Switzerland. If you write to your friend any time this month, it will find him there.' Vincent took the address down in his notebook and turned to go. "'Good day,' said Mr. Fladgate. "'Delighted to have been of any service to you. "'By the way, I suppose you saw your friends?' But before he could allude to Mark Ashburn's marriage, he found himself alone, Vincent having already taken a somewhat abrupt departure. He could not trust himself to hear Mark talked of in this pleasant vein any longer. It had required some effort on his part to restrain himself when he first knew the truth, and only the consciousness that his unsupported assertions would do no good had kept him silent. He would wait to make his claim until he could bring evidence that could not be disregarded. He would go to Mark Ashburn and force him to give him an acknowledgment which would carry conviction to every mind. He would go at once. Mark had evidently gone to this place gross laufingen with the idea of avoiding him he would follow him there he lost no time in making inquiries and soon learnt that gross laufingen was about two hours journey from basel and that by leaving london next morning he would catch the fast train through from calais to basel and arrive there early on the following day he made all the necessary arrangements for starting and wrote to caffin to say that he was going abroad though he did not enter into further details, and on receiving this letter, Caffin took the opportunity of gratifying his malicious sense of humour by dispatching, at considerable trouble and expense to himself, for Wastwater is far enough from any telegraph poles, the message Mark had received from little Max's hand on the mount. Vincent set out on his journey with a fierce impatience for the end, when he would find himself face to face with this man whom he had thought his friend, whose affectionate emotion had touched and cheered him when they met at Plymouth, and who had been deliberately deceiving him from the first. All the night through he pictured the meeting to himself, with a stern joy at the thought of seeing Mark's handsome false face change with terror at the sight of him. Would he beg for mercy, or try to defend himself? Would he dare to persist in his fraud? At the bare thought of this last possibility a wave of mad passion swept over his brain. He felt that in such a case he could not answer for what he might say or do. But with the morning calmer thoughts came. He did not want revenge, only justice. 
Mark should restore everything in full. It was his own fault if he had placed himself in such a position that he could not do that without confessing his own infamy. If there was any way of recovering his own and sparing Mark to some extent in the eyes of the world, he would agree to it for the sake of their old friendship, which had been strong and sincere on his own side at least. But no sentimental consideration should stand between him and his right. Basel was reached in the early morning, and the pretty city was flushed with rose, and the newly risen sun was sparkling on the variegated roofs and couplers as he drove across the bridge to the Baden station. He felt jaded and ill after a journey in which he had slept but little, and finding that he would not be able to go on to Laufingen for some time, was obliged to recruit himself by a few hours' sleep at an hotel. It was past midday when he awoke, and the next train, which started late in the afternoon, brought him to Laufingen, just as the last sunset rays were reddening the old grey ruin on the hill, and the towns and river below showed themselves in an enchanted atmosphere of violet haze. Leaving his luggage at the station until he should have found a place to stay at for the night, Vincent walked down to the bridge intending to go to the Rhinefall Hotel and inquire for Mark. There is a point where the covered portion of the bridge ends, and the structure is supported by a massive stone pier, whose angels, facing up and down the river, and protected by a broad parapet, form recesses on either side of the roadway. Here he stopped for a moment, fascinated by the charm of the scene, and, leaning upon the ledge, watched the last touches of scarlet, fading out of the slate-coloured cloud-masses in the west. He was roused from this occupation by a voice which called his name in a low, tremulous tone, which sent the blood rushing back to his heart, and as he turned to see a graceful figure just passing out from under the arched roof towards him, he recognised Mabel Langton. The dying light fell full on her face, which had an expression half of awe, half of incredulous joy she came towards him holding out two eager hands and the awe vanished but the joy grew more assured vincent she cried is it really you you have come back to us or am i dreaming he had met her at last and in this place to which he had come anticipating nothing but pain and contest she had not forgotten him the glad shining in her sweet eyes told him that, and a great and glorious hope sprang up within him. In her presence he forgot his wrongs, he forgot the very object of a journey which had thus led him to her side. All his past feelings seemed petty and ignoble, and fame itself a matter of little worth. He took her small gloved hands and stood there, resting his eyes on her dear face, which had haunted his thoughts through all his weary exile. "'Thank God!' he murmured. "'It is no dream this time.'" End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of The Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 in suspense mark as he left his wife with that hastily invented excuse of the forgotten tobacco turned back with a blind instinct of escape he went to the foot of the hilly little street down which mabel and he had lately passed and halted there undecidedly then he saw a flight of rough steps by a stone fountain and climbed them clutching the wooden rail hard as he went up they led to a little row of cabins, barricaded by stacks of pine wood, and further on there was another short flight of steps which brought him out upon a little terrace in front of a primitive stucco church. Here he paused to recover breath and think, if thought were possible. Above the irregular line of high-pitched brown roofs at his feet, he could just catch a glimpse of the rushing green rhine, with the end of the covered way on the bridge and the little recess beyond it was light enough still for him to see clearly the pair that stood in that recess 
Vincent's broad figure leaning earnestly towards that other one. He was drawing closer. Now he drew back again, as if to watch the effect of his words. Mark knew well what she must be hearing down there. He strained his eyes as the dusk shrouded the two more and more. He thought that, even there, he would be able to see a change when the blow fell. "'Mabel, my darling, my innocent darling,' he groaned aloud, "'have pity on me. Do not give me up.' From the opposite side he could hear the faint strains of a street organ, which was playing a lively popular air. It had come in that morning, and he and Mabel had been amused at the excitement it produced among the unsophisticated inhabitants. It had exhausted its repertoire over and over again, but its popularity seemed yet undiminished. As he leaned there on the rough stone parapet, his panic gradually abated, and the suspense became intolerable. He could not stay there. By this time, too, the worst must have happened. It was useless to try to avoid the inevitable. He would go down and face his doom, without giving her further cause to despise him. The idea of denying the charge never occurred to him for a moment. He knew that face to face with his accuser, such audacity was beyond his powers. He had nothing to say in defence, but he must hear his sentence. And so, in a sort of despairing apathy, he went steadily down again to the street level, and, with a self-command for which he had not dared to hope, passed with a firm tread along the covered way across the bridge. After the first surprise of meeting, Vincent had had to explain, in answer to Mabel's eager questions, the manner in which he had escaped being a victim to the Mangalore disaster. The explanation was commonplace enough, and when it was given, she exclaimed reproachfully, "'But why did you lead us all to believe that the worst had happened? "'You must have known how it would grieve us. "'It was not like you, Vincent.' "'But I wrote,' he rejoined. "'Surely you got my letter, Mabel?' "'You did write, then,' she said. "'I'm glad of that. "'But the letter never came. "'I never dreamed that there was the slightest hope till I saw you here. "'I hardly dared to speak to you at first. "'And how do you come to be here at all? "'You have not told me that yet.' "'I was on my way to punish a scoundrel,' he said abruptly. "'But I had almost forgotten all that. "'Never mind about me, Mabel. "'Tell me about yourself now. "'You don't know how I have been longing "'for the very smallest news of you.' "'What am I to tell you?' said Mabel, smiling. "'Where shall I begin, Vincent?' "'Well, first, your own question back again,' he said. "'How do you come to be here, and all alone? "'Are your people at the hotel? "'Am I to see them to-night?' "'My people are all at Glenthorne just now,' said Mabel, with some natural surprise, "'which, however, only made Vincent conclude she must be travelling with friends. "'Were they her future parents-in-law?' he wondered jealously. "'He could not rest till he knew how that was. "'Mabel,' he said earnestly, "'They told me you were engaged. Is it true?' She had not yet grown quite accustomed to her new dignity as a wife, and felt a certain shyness in having to announce it to Vincent. "'It was,' she said, looking down. "'It is not true now. "'Haven't you really heard that, Vincent?' But, instead of reading her embarrassment aright, he saw in it an intimation that his worst fears were without foundation. He had not come too late. She was free. There was hope for him yet. But even then he did not dare to express the wild joy he felt. "'Do you mean,' he said, and his voice betrayed nothing, "'that it is broken off?' "'Broken off?' she repeated, with a little touch of bewilderment. "'Why, oh, Vincent, what a dreadful thing to ask! I thought you would understand, and you don't a bit.' i am not engaged now because because this is my wedding journey if vincent had been slow to understand before he understood now it was all over this was final irrevocable the radiant prospect which had seemed to open a moment before to his dazzled eyes had closed for ever 
for a moment or two he did not speak if he had made any sound it would have been a cry of pain but he repressed it that must be his secret now and he would keep it till death he kept it well then at least for there was no faltering in his voice as he said slowly i did not know you will let me congratulate you mabel and and wish you every happiness thank you vincent said mabel not too warmly thinking that from so old a friend as vincent these felicitations were cold and conventional you are happy are you not he said anxiously happier than i ever thought possible she said softly when you see my my husband she spoke the word with a pretty shy pride and know how good he is vincent you will understand if she had ever suspected the place she filled in vincent's heart she would have spared him this as it was she treated him as an affectionate elder brother who needed to be convinced that she had chosen wisely and it was in some degree his own fault that she did so he had never given her reason to think otherwise i wish he would come i can't think where he can be all this time continued mabel i want you to know one another i'm sure you will like mark vincent when you know him vincent started now unmistakably not all his self-control could prevent that till that moment it had not occurred to him that mabel's presence there in the town where he had expected to come upon mark was more than a coincidence he had been led to believe that mark and she were not even acquainted and even the discovery that she was married did not prepare him for something more overwhelming still mark he cried did you say mark is that your husband's name not not mark ashburn how that seems to astonish you says mabel but i forgot how stupid of me why you are a friend of his are you not holroyd's anger came back to him all at once with a deadly force that turned his heart to stone i used to be he answered coldly not caring very much just then in his bitterness if the scorn he felt betrayed itself or not but mabel took his answer literally why of course she said i remember we came upon your portrait once at home and he asked if it was not you and said you were one of his oldest friends i thought he would have forgotten that was all vincent's answer i'm quite sure he will be very glad to welcome you back again said mabel and you will be glad to hear that since you saw him he has become famous you have been so long away that you may not have heard of the great book he has written illusion i have read it said vincent shortly i did not know he wrote it he did write it said mabel but for that we might never have known one another he has to admit that even though he does try to run down his work sometimes and insist that it has been very much overrated he says so does he vincent replied yes i can quite understand that some intonation in his voice struck mabel's ear perhaps you agree with him she retorted jealously holroyd laughed harshly no indeed he said i should be the last man in the world to do that i only meant i could understand your husband taking that view i read the book with intense interest i assure you you don't speak as if you quite meant me to believe that she said i'm afraid the book was not practical enough to please you vincent ceylon seems to have hardened you very possibly he replied and then followed a short silence during which mabel was thinking that he had certainly altered hardly for the better and holroyd was wondering how much longer he would have to bear this he was afraid of himself feeling the danger of a violent outburst which might reveal her delusion with a too brutal plainness she must know all some time but not here not then he had finally mastered any rebellious impulses however as mabel who had been anxiously watching the bridge for some time went to meet some one with a glad cry of relief he heard her making some rapid explanations and then she returned followed by mark ashburn 
Mabel's greeting told the wretched Mark that the blow had not fallen yet. Vincent evidently was determined to spare neither of them. Let him strike the blow, then. The less delay, the better. He walked up to the man who was his executioner with a dull, dogged expectation of what was coming. He tried to keep himself straight, but he felt that his head was shaking, as if with palsy, and he was grateful that the dusk hid his face. "'Here is Mark at last,' said Mabel. "'He will tell you himself that he at least has not forgotten.' But Mark said nothing. He did not even put out his hand. He stood silently waiting for the other to speak. Vincent was silent too for a time, looking at him fixedly. This was how they had met then. He had pictured that meeting many times lately, but it had never been anything like the reality. And Mabel still suspected nothing. There was a touch of comedy of the ghastly kind in the situation, which gave Vincent a grim amusement, and he felt a savage pleasure, of which he was justly ashamed later, in developing it. "'I have been trying to explain to your wife,' he said at last, "'that I have been away so long that I could hardly hope you would remember the relations between us.' Mark made some reply to this. He did not know what. "'At least,' Vincent continued calmly, "'I may congratulate you upon the success of your book.' I should have done so when we met the other day if I had understood then that you were the author. Your modesty did not allow you to mention it, and so I discover it later. Mark said nothing, though his dry lips moved. When you met, cried Mabel in wonder, did you know Vincent was alive then, Mark, and you never told me? He naturally did not think it would interest you, you see, said Vincent. No said mabel turning to mark you couldn't know that vincent had once been almost one of the family i forgot that if you had only thought of telling me the two men were silent again and mabel felt hurt and disappointed at vincent's want of cordiality he seemed to take it for granted that he had been forgotten he would thaw presently and she did her best to bring this about by all the means in her power in her anxiety that the man she respected should do justice to the man she loved. That conversation was, as far as Mark was concerned, like the one described in Aurora Lee. Quote, Every common word seemed t tangled with the thunder at one end, and ready to pull down upon their heads a terror out of sight. End quote. The terror was close at hand when Mabel said, in the course of her well-meant efforts to bring them into conversation, it was quite by accident do you know mark that vincent should have met us here at all he was on his way to find some man who has i forget what you say he has done vincent i don't think i went into particulars he replied i described him generally as a scoundrel and he is i hope you were able to find that out before he could do you any injury said mabel unfortunately no he said when I found out, the worst was done. "'Would you rather not talk about it?' she continued. "'Or do you mind telling us how you were treated?' Vincent hesitated. Just then the sense of his wrong, the sight of the man who had deceived him, made him hard as adamant. Could he desire a fuller satisfaction than was offered him now? "'It's rather a long story,' he said. "'Perhaps this is not quite the place to tell it. "'You might find it interesting, though, from the literary point of view,' he added, turning suddenly on Mark, who did not attempt to meet his eyes. "'Tell it, by all means, then,' said the latter, without moving his head. "'No, you shall hear it another time,' said Holroyd. "'Put shortly, Mabel, it's this. "'I trusted the other man. He deceived me. "'Nothing very original in that, is there?' "'I'm afraid not,' said Mabel. "'Did he rob you, Vincent? Have you lost much?' "'Much more than money. Yes, he robbed me first and paid me the compliment of a highly artistic chain of lies afterwards. That was a needless waste. The ordinary sort of lie would have been quite enough for me, from him.' Mark heard all this with a savage inclination at first to cut the scene short, and say to Mabel, "'He means me. I robbed him.' I lied to him. I am the scoundrel. 
It's all true. I own it. Now let me go. But he let Holroyd take his own course in the end, with an apathetic acknowledgment that he had the right to revenge himself to the very utmost. The house at the nearer end of the bridge had a small projecting gallery, where he remembered having seen a tame fox run out when he was there in the autumn before. He caught himself vaguely speculating whether the fox was there still, or if it had died, and yet he heard every word that Vincent was saying. "'And what do you mean to do with him when you meet?' asked Mabel. "'Ah,' said Vincent, "'I have thought over that a good deal. I have often wondered whether I could keep calm enough to say what I mean to say. I think I shall.' In these civilised days we have to repress ourselves now and then, and that won't, of course, prevent me from punishing him as he deserves. And when those nearest and dearest to him know him as he really is, and turn from him, even he will feel that a punishment. He turned to Mark again. "'Don't you agree with me?' he asked. Mark moistened his lips before answering. "'I think you will find it very easy to punish him,' he said. "'Is he... is he married?' asked Mabel. "'Oh, yes,' said Vincent. "'I was told that his wife believes in him still.' "'And you are going to undeceive her?' she said. "'She must know the truth. "'That is part of his punishment,' replied Vincent. "'But it will be so terrible for her, poor thing,' said Mabel, "'with an infinite compassion in her voice.' "'What if the truth were to kill her?' "'Better that,' he said bitterly, "'than to go on loving a lie. "'Whatever happens, her husband is responsible, not I. "'That is the correct view, Ashburn, I think.' "'Quite correct,' said Mark. "'It may be correct,' said Mabel indignantly, "'but it is very cruel. "'I didn't think you could be so harsh, either of you. "'Of course I don't know what the man has done. "'Perhaps if I did, i might be correct too but vincent i do ask you to think a little of his poor wife she at least has done you no harm is there no way no way at all to get back something of what you have lost even to punish the man if you must and yet spare his wife if there were he cried passionately do you suppose i would not take it is it my fault that this man has done me such a wrong that he can only make amends for it by exposing himself what can i do i suppose there is no help for it then agreed mabel reluctantly but i wish she had not to suffer too only think what it must be to have to give up believing in one's husband and as she spoke she slid a confiding hand through mark's arm there was another silence and as it seemed plain now that the interview was not likely to be a success she made haste to end it. "'We must say good-bye now, Vincent,' she said. "'I hope you are not so harsh as your words.' "'I don't know. I feel considerably harsher just now, I think,' he said. "'Good-bye, then, Mabel. By the way, Ashburn,' he added in a slightly lowered tone, "'there is something I have to say to you.' "'I know,' muttered Mark doggedly. "'Are you going to say it now?' "'No, not now,' he answered. "'You must meet me. Where shall we say? I don't know this place. Here? No, on that little terrace over there by the fountain. It will be quieter. Be there at nine. I am going to tell your husband the details of that story, Mabel,' he continued aloud, "'and then we shall decide what to do. You will spare him to me for half an hour?' "'Oh, yes,' said Mabel cheerfully. She thought this looked as if they were going to arrive at a better understanding.' mark looked at vincent but his face was impenetrable in the dim light as he added again in an undertone you are to say nothing until i give you leave if you are not at the place by nine remember i shall come to you oh i will be there said mark recklessly and they parted as mabel and mark were walking back she said suddenly i suppose when you met vincent last you told him that you were going to marry me mark "'Didn't he say so?' he answered, prevaricating even then. "'I thought you must have done so,' she said, and was silent. "'Vincent had known, then. "'He had deliberately kept away from them all. 
he had pretended to ignore the marriage when they met that was his way of resenting it she had not thought of this till then and it confirmed her in the idea that ceylon had sadly changed him they dined alone together in the large bare spicer salle for the handsome hotel was scarcely ever occupied even in the season now they had it all to themselves and the waiters almost fought with one another for the privilege of attending upon them the director himself a lively talkative little german who felt his managerial talents wasted in this wilderness came in to superintend their meals partly to refresh himself by the contemplation of two real guests but chiefly to extend his english vocabulary hitherto mark had considered him a nuisance but he was glad that evening when the host followed the fish in with his customary greeting good night you have made a good folk good appetit yes and proceeded to invite them to a grand concert which was to take place in the hotel the following sunday there will be the band from klanglaufengen it is all brass it is better as you will not go too near they blow very strong then they go off but a lady from here will gamble beautifully after them on the piano you will come yes when he had gone at last little max came in and stood by mabel with his mouth gaping like a young bird's for ch for chance fragments of dessert mark was grateful to him too for diverting her attention from himself he grew more and more silent as the long black forest clock by the shining porcelain stove ticked slowly on towards the hour it was time to go and he rose with a shiver you will not be very long away will you dear said mabel looking up from the orange she was peeling for the child and you will do what you can for the poor woman i know yes yes he said as he reached the door good-bye mabel good-bye she said nodding to him brightly max say good evening herr mark a pleasant walk but max backed away behind the stove declining to commit himself to an unknown tongue mark took a last look at her laughing gaily there in the lamplight would he ever hear her laugh like that again how would he ever find courage to tell her there was little need just then of holroyd's prohibition he went down to the hotel steps to the little open space where the two streets unite and where the oil lamps suspended above by cords dropped a shadow like a huge spider on the pale patch of lighted ground below the night was warm and rather dark no one was about at that hour the only sound was the gurgle of the fountain in the corner where the water jets gleamed out of the blackness like rods of twisted crystal he entered the narrow streets or rather alley leading to the bridge in the state of blank misery he was in his eye seized upon the smallest objects as if to distract his mind and he observed as he might not have done had he been happy that in the lighted upper room of the corner house they had trained growing ivy along the low raftered ceiling so too as he went on he noticed details in each dim small paned shop front he passed the tobacconist's big wooden negro sitting with bundles of hamburg cigars in his lap and filling up the whole of the window the two rows of dangling silver watches at the watchmakers the butcher's unglazed slab with its strong iron bars behind which one small and solitary joint was caged like something dangerous to society even the grotesque forms in which the jugs and vases at the china shop were shadowed on the opposite wall he looked up at a quaint metal ensign an ancient ship which swung from a wrought iron bracket overhead when next i pass under that he thought he came to the end of the street at last when his way to the place of meeting lay straight on but he turned to his right instead past the zollverein where the chief was busy writing by the window under his linen shaded oil lamp and on to the bridge as if some irresistible attraction were drawing him when he reached the recess opposite to that in which mabel had met vincent he stopped mechanically and looked around the towns were perfectly still save for the prolonged organ note of the falls which soon ceases to strike the ear 
on either bank the houses gleamed pale under a low sky where the greenish moonlight struggled through the rack of angry black clouds while he stood there the clock under the church coupler above struck the quarters and clanged out the hour followed after a becoming pause by the gatehouse clock across the river and such others as the twin towns possessed it was nine o'clock vincent holroyd was waiting there on the terrace stern and pitiless mark made a movement as if to leave the recess and then stopped short it was no use he could not face holroyd he looked over the side down on the water swirling by in which the few house lights were reflected in a dull and broken glimmer was there any escape for him there it would only be a plunge down into that swollen russian torrent and he would be past all rescue an instant of suffocating pain then singing in his ears sparks in his eyes unconsciousness annihilation perhaps who knew just then any other world any other penalty seemed preferable to life and mabel's contempt from the recess he could see an angle of the hotel and one of the windows of their room it was lighted mabel was sitting there in the armchair perhaps waiting for him if he went back he must tell her if he went back whether he lived or died she was equally lost to him now his life would bring her only misery and humiliation at least he could leave her free vincent would speak and think less hardly of him then and if not would it matter his mind was made up he would do it he looked towards mabel's window with a wild despairing gaze forgive me he cried with a hoarse sob as if she could hear and then he threw off his hat and sprang upon the broad parapet End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four on the laufenplatz vincent had left the gasthaus zur post the old-fashioned inn outside klein laufingen at which he had taken up his quarters for the night a little before nine and walked down the street with his mind finally made up as to the course he meant to take although he shrank from the coming interview almost as intensely as mark himself he passed under the covered way of the bridge and had nearly reached the open part when he recognized the man he was coming to meet standing in one of the recesses he noticed him look round in evident fear of observation he did not seem however to have seen or heard vincent and presently the latter saw him throw his hat away as if in preparation for action of some sort vincent guessed at once what he was intending to do it darted across his mind that this might be the best solution of the difficulty he had only to keep silent for a few seconds was it certain even now that he could prevent this self-destruction if he would but such inhumanity was impossible to him instinctively he rushed forward out of the shadow and seizing mark by the arm as he sprung upon the parapet dragged him roughly back you coward he cried you fool this is the way you keep your appointment is it you can do that afterwards if you like just now you will come with me tragic as the rash act such as mark was contemplating is when successful an interruption brings with it an inevitable pathos when he first felt that grasp on his arm he thought himself in the power of a german policeman and prepared as he was a moment before to face a sudden death he quailed before the prospect of some degrading and complicated official process it was almost a relief to see instead his bitterest enemy he made no attempt at resistance or escape perhaps life seemed more tolerable after all now he had been brought back to it he went meekly back with vincent who still held his arm firmly and they reached the laufenplatz without another word the little terrace above the rhine was almost dark the only light came in a reflected form from a street lamp round the corner and they had to pick their way round the octagonal stone fountain and between the big iron salmon cages to some seats under the five bare elms by the railings 
there vincent sat down to recover breath for the scene he had just gone through was beginning to tell upon him and he was overcome by a feeling of faintness which made him unable to speak for some moments meanwhile mark stood opposite by the railings waiting sullenly until vincent rose at last and came to his side he spoke low and with difficulty but in spite of the torrent roaring over the rocks below mark heard every word i suppose vincent began i need not tell you why i wished to see you no said mark i know from your manner on the bridge just now continued holroyd relentlessly it looked almost as if you wished to avoid a meeting why should you i told you i wished my authorship to be kept a secret and you sheltered it with your own name very few friends would have done that you have the right to indulge in this kind of pleasantry said the tortured mark i know that only be moderate if you can cut the sneers and the reproaches short and give me the finishing stroke do you suppose i don't feel what i am reproaches are ungenerous of course retorted holroyd i am coming to the finishing stroke as you call it in my own time but first though you may consider it bad taste on my part i want to know a little more about all this if it's painful to you i'm sorry but you scarcely have the right to be sensitive oh i have no rights said mark bitterly i'll try not to abuse mine said vincent more calmly but i can't understand why you did this you could write books for yourself what made you covet mine i'll tell you all there is to tell said mark i didn't covet your book it was like this my own novels had both been rejected i knew i had no chance as things were of ever getting a publisher to look at them i felt i only wanted a fair start then fladgate got it into his head that i was the author of that manuscript of yours i did tell him how it really was but he wouldn't believe me and then upon my soul holroyd i thought you were dead and had no rights concluded the other dryly i see go on i was mad i suppose continued mark i let him think he was right and then i met mabel by that time everybody knew me as the author of illusion i i could not tell her i was not then we were engaged and four days before the wedding you came back you know all the rest yes i know the rest cried vincent passionately you came to meet me how overcome you were i thought it was joy and thanked heaven like the fool i was that i had any one in the world to care so much about me and you let me tell you about about her and you and caffyn between you kept me in the dark till you could get me safely out of the way it was a clever scheme you managed it admirably you need not have stolen from any one with such powers of constructing a plot of your own there is just one thing though i should like to have explained i wrote mabel a letter i know now that she never received it why how can i tell said mark good god holroyd you don't suspect me of that are you so far above suspicion asked vincent it would only be a very few more pages well i deserved it said mark but whether you believe me or not i never saw a letter of yours until the other day i never imagined you were alive even till i read your letter to me that must have been a delightful surprise for you said vincent you kept your head though you did not let it interfere with your arrangements you have married her you of all the men in the world nothing can ever undo that now nothing i have married her said mark god forgive me for it but at least she cares for no one else holroyd she loves me whatever i am you need not tell me that interrupted vincent i know it i have seen it for myself you have been clever even in that what do you mean asked mark do you know what that book of mine was to me continued vincent without troubling to answer i put all that was best of myself into it i thought it might plead for me some day perhaps to a heart i hoped to touch and i come back to find that you have won the heart and not even left me my book as for the book said mark that will be yours again now 
"'I meant to make it so when I came here,' Vincent answered. "'I meant to force you to own my rights, whatever the acknowledgement cost you. "'But I know now that I must give that up. "'I abandon all claim to the book. "'You have chosen to take it. "'You can keep it.' The revulsion of feeling caused by so unexpected an announcement almost turned Mark's head for the moment. He caught Vincent by the arm in his excitement. "'What?' he cried. "'Is this a trick? Are you in earnest? You will spare me, after all? You must not, Vincent. I can't have it. I don't deserve it.' Vincent drew back coldly. "'Did I say you deserved it?' he asked, with a contempt that stung Mark. "'Then I won't accept it, do you hear?' he persisted. "'You shall not make this sacrifice for me.' Holroyd laughed grimly enough. "'For you,' he repeated. "'You don't suppose I should tamely give up everything for you, do you?' "'Then,' faltered Mark, "'why? Why?' "'Why am I going to let you alone? "'Do you remember what I told you on that platform at Plymouth? "'That is why.' If I had only known then, I would have fought my hardest to expose you if it was necessary to save her in that way. For her sake, not mine, I don't suppose there ever was much hope for me. As it is, you have been clever enough to choose the one shield through which I can't strike you. If I ever thought more of that wretched book than of her happiness, it was only for a moment. She knows nothing as yet, and she must never know. "'She will know it some day,' said Mark heavily. "'Why should she know?' demanded Vincent impatiently. "'You don't mean that that infernal Caffin knows?' "'No, no,' replied Mark, in all sincerity. "'Caffin doesn't know. How could he? "'But you can't hide these things. "'You, you may have talked about it yourself already.' "'I have not talked about it,' said Vincent sharply. "'Perhaps I was not too proud of having been gulled so easily.' "'Can't you understand? This secret rests between you and me at present, and I shall never breathe a word of it. You can feel perfectly safe. You are Mabel's husband.' It is to be feared that Vincent's manner was far enough from the sublime and heroic. He gave up his book and his fame from the conviction that he could not do otherwise. But it was not easy for all that, and he did not try to disguise the bitter contempt he felt for the cause mark could not endure the humiliation of such a pardon his spirit rose in revolt against it do you think i will be forgiven like this he cried recklessly i don't want your mercy i won't take it if you won't speak i shall vincent had not expected any resistance from mark and this outburst which was genuine enough showed that he was not utterly beneath contempt even then Holroyd's manner was less harsh and contemptuous when he next spoke. "'It's no use, Ashburn,' he said firmly. "'It's too late for all that now. You must accept it.' "'I shall not,' said Mark again. "'I've been a scoundrel, I know, but I'll be one no longer. I'll tell the truth and give you back your own. I will do what's right at last.' "'Not in that way,' said Vincent. "'I forbid it.' I have the right to be obeyed in this, and you shall obey me. Listen to me, Ashburn. You can't do this. You forget Mabel. You have made her love you and trust her happiness to your keeping. Your honour is hers now. Can't you see what shame and misery you will plunge her in by such a confession? It may clear your conscience, but it must darken her life, and that's too heavy a price to pay for such a mere luxury as peace of mind. "'How can I go on deceiving her?' groaned Mark. "'It will drive me mad!' "'It will do nothing of the sort,' retorted Holroyd, his anger returning. "'I know you better. In a couple of days it won't even affect your appetite. "'Why, if I had not come over here, if I had gone out again to India, as you hoped I should, "'you were prepared to go on deceiving her. Your mind kept its balance well enough then.' Mark knew this was true, and held his tongue. "'Think of me as safe in India, then,' Vincent continued more quietly. "'I shall trouble you quite as little. But this secret is mine as well as yours, and I will not have it told. If you denounce yourself now, who will be the better for it? Think what it will cost Mabel. 
"'You do love her, don't you?' he asked, with a fierce anxiety. "'You—you you have not married her for other reasons.' "'You think I am too bad even to love honestly?' said Mark bitterly. "'But I do.' "'Prove it, then.' said vincent you heard her pleading on the bridge for the woman who would suffer by her husband's shame she was pleading for herself then and not to me only to you have pity on her she is so young to lose all her faith and love and hope at once you can never let her know what you have been you can only try to become all she believes you to be in his heart perhaps mark was not sorry to be convinced that what he had resolved to do was impossible the high-strung mood in which he had been ready to proclaim his wrongdoing was already passing away vincent had gained his point you are right mark said slowly i will keep it from her if i can very well vincent answered that is settled then if she asks you what has passed between us you can say that i have told you my story but that you are not at liberty to speak of it mabel will not try to know more stay i will write a line and he went to the corner of the street and wrote a few words on a leaf from his notebook give that to her he said as he returned and now i think we've nothing more to say only one other thing stammered mark i must do this when they they published your book they paid me i never touched the money i have brought it with me to-night you must take it and he held out a small packet of notes. Vincent turned haughtily away. "'Excuse me,' he said. "'It is not mine. I will have nothing to do with it. Under the circumstances, you can't expect me to touch that money. Keep it. Do what you choose with it.' "'I choose this, then,' said Mark, violently, and tearing the notes up, he flung them over the railings to drift down on the rocks or into the tossing grey foam beyond. "'You need not have done that.' said Holroyd, coldly. There were the poor, but just as you please. And he made a movement as if to go. Mark stopped him with a gesture. "'Are you going like this?' he said, and his voice trembled. "'If you knew all I felt, even you might pity me a little. Can't you forgive?' Vincent turned. "'No,' he said shortly. "'I can't. I put temptation in your way, and though I never dreamed then— that it could be a temptation to you i could have forgiven you for giving way to it when you believed me dead but i came back and you went on with it you lied to me more you dared to marry her without a care for the shame and sorrow which was all you had to bring her if i said i forgave you for that it would be a mockery i don't and i can't i see said mark when we meet again we are to be strangers then no said vincent if we meet we must do so as ordinary acquaintances for mabel's sake but there are no appearances to keep up here can't you see i want to be left to myself he asked with a sudden burst of nervous irritation have your way then said mark and left him there by the railings Mark's first feelings as he walked slowly back up the little street where the little shops were all shattered and dark now were by no means enviable. He felt infinitely mean and small in his own eyes and shrank from entering Mabel's presence while his nerves were still crawling under the scorching contempt of Vincent's dismissal. If during the interview there had been moments when he was deeply contrite and touched at the clemency so unexpectedly shown him, the manner of his pardon seemed to release him from all obligations to gratitude he had only been forgiven for another's sake and for a time he almost loathed so disgraceful an immunity and felt the deep humiliation of a sentence that condemned him to pay the price of lies by being constrained to lie on still but by degrees even in that short walk his elastic temperament began to assert itself after all it might have been worse he might by now have been drifting dead and disfigured down the river to basel he might have been going back to mabel with the fearful necessity upon him of telling her all that night one person knew him and despised him for what he was but that person would never tell his secret that painful scene which had just passed would never have to be gone through again he could think of it as a horrible dream 
Yes, he was safe now, really safe this time. His position was far more secure than when he had read that telegram of Caffin's, and here he wondered for the first time whether Caffin had been deliberately misled or only mistaken in sending such a delusive message. But that did not very much matter now, and he soon abandoned speculation on the subject. He had much to be thankful for. His future was free from all danger. He had had a severe lesson, and he would profit by it. Henceforth, with the one necessary reservation, he would be honest and true. Mabel should never repent her trust in him. Sweet bells jangled would be before the world by the time they returned, and after that he feared nothing. And so, though he was subdued and silent on his return, there was no other trace in his manner of what he had suffered during the last hour. He found Mabel by the window of their sitting-room, looking out at the houses across the river, which were now palely clear in the cold moonlight, their lights extinguished, and only a pane glittering here and there in some high dormer window, while the irregular wooden galleries and hanging outhouses were all thrown up vividly by the intense shadows. "'What a very long time you have been away,' she said. "'But I know Vincent can be very pleasant and interesting if he likes.' "'Very,' said Mark, and gave her Holroyd's note. "'I leave here early to-morrow for Italy,' she read, "'and may not see you again for some little time. "'I have told your husband my story, but, on consideration, "'have thought it best to pledge him to tell no one, not even you. "'But the man who injured me shall be safe for your sake.' "'You did persuade him, then,' she said, looking up gratefully to Mark. "'Oh, I am glad. How good you are! and how well you must have spoken, dear, to make him give up his idea of punishing the man. So, Vincent is going away at once. Do you know, I am afraid, I am rather glad. And Mark made no answer. What was there to say? Vincent stood there by the railings on the Laufenplatz for some time after Mark had left him. He was feeling the reaction both in mind and body from his recent conflict. "'How will it all end?' he asked himself wearily. "'Can any good come from letting this deceit go on? "'Is he strong enough to carry out his part? "'If not, the truth will only come at last, "'and be even more cruel when it does come.' "'Yet he had done what still seemed the obvious and only thing to do, "'if Mabel's happiness was considered. "'He was ashamed even that he had not seen it earlier.' and trembled as he remembered that only a providential chance had restrained him from some fatal disclosure to mabel that afternoon on the bridge but at least he had acted for the best and he would hope for it thinking thus he recrossed the river to klein laufingen where a mounted german officer many sizes too big for the little street was rousing it from its first slumber as he clattered along with his horse's hoofs striking sparks from the rough cobbles and passed under the old gateway, where his accoutrements gleamed for an instant in the lamplight before horse and rider vanished in the darkness beyond. Vincent passed out, too, out on the broad white road, and down the hill to his homely guest house. He felt weak and very lonely, lonelier even than when he had parted from Mabel long ago on the eve of his Ceylon voyage. He could hope, then, now he had lost her for ever still one of his wishes had been granted he had been able to be of service to her to make some sacrifice for her dear sake she would never know either of his love or his sacrifice and though he could not pretend that there was no bitterness in that he felt that it was better thus after all he thought she loves that fellow she would never have cared for me and there was truth in this last conclusion even if Mabel and Mark had never met, and she could have known Vincent as he was, the knowledge might not have taught her to love. A woman cannot give her heart as a pre montion or there might be more bachelors than there are. End of chapter 34《Chapter 35 of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35 
Mist Fire It was an evening early in May, and Harold Caffin was waiting at Victoria for the arrival of the Dover train, which was bringing back Mark and Mabel from the continent. This delicate attention on his part was the result of a painful uncertainty which had been vexing him ever since the morning on which he read Vincent's farewell note at Wastwater. It is a poor tale, as Mrs. Poyser might say, to throw your bomb and never have the satisfaction of hearing it explode. And yet that was his position. He had shot his arrow into the air, like Longfellow, but less fortunate than the poet, he was anything but sure that his humble effort had reached the heart of a friend. Now he was going to know. One thing he had ascertained from the Langtons, Vincent Holroyd had certainly followed the couple to Laufingen, and they had seen him there. Harold had found Mrs. Langton full of the wonderful news of the return of the dead. But nothing had come of it as yet. If there was a sensation in store for the literary world, Mabel's letters apparently contained no hint of it, and for a time Catherine felt unpleasantly apprehensive that there might have been a hitch somehow in his admirable arrangements. Then he reflected that Mabel would naturally spare her mother as long as possible. He would not believe that after all the trouble he had taken, after Holroyd had actually hunted down the culprit, the secret could have been kept from her any longer. No, she must know the real truth, though she might be proud enough to mask her sufferings while she could. But still he longed for some visible assurance that his revenge had not unaccountably failed and as he ascertained that they were to return on this particular evening, and were not to be met except by the Langton carriage, it occurred to him that here would be an excellent opportunity of observing Mabel at a time when she would not imagine it necessary to wear a mask. He would take care to remain unseen himself, a single glance would tell him all he needed to know, and he promised himself enjoyment of a refined and spiritual kind in reading the effects of his revenge in the vivid face he had loved once, and hated now with such malignant intensity. The train came in with a fringe of expectant porters hanging on the footboards, and as the doors flew open to discharge a crowd, flurried but energetic, like stirred ants, even Caffin's well-regulated pulse beat faster. He had noticed Champion waiting on the platform, and kept his eye upon him in the bustle that followed. He was going up to a compartment now. That must be Mark he was touching his hat to as he received directions. Caffin could not see Mark's face yet, as his back was towards him, but he could see Mabel's as she stepped lightly out on the platform. There was a bright smile on her face as she acknowledged the footman's salute, and seemed to be asking eager questions. Caffin felt uncomfortable, for there was nothing forced about her smile no constraint in her eyes as she turned to Mark when they were alone again, and seemed to be expressing her eager delight at being home again. And Mark, too, had the face of a man without a care in the world. Something must have gone wrong, terribly wrong, it was clear. They were coming towards him. He had meant to avoid them at first, but now his curiosity would not allow this, and he threw himself in their way, affecting an artless surprise and pleasure at being the first to welcome them back. Mark did not appear at all disconcerted to see him, and Mabel could not be frigid to anybody just then in the flush of happy expectation, which she did not try to conceal. Altogether, it was a bitter disappointment to Caffin. He quite gasped when Mark said, with a frank unconsciousness, and without waiting for the subject to be introduced by him, "'Oh, I say, Caffin!' "'What on earth made you think poor old Vincent was going back to India at once? "'He's not going to do anything of the kind. "'He's wandering about the continent. "'We knocked up against him in Laufingen.' "'Caffin gave a searching look at Mabel's sweet, tranquil face, "'then at Mark's, which bore no sign of guilt or confusion. "'Knocked up against you?' he repeated. "'Why, why, didn't he expect to find you there, then?' "'Mabel answered this. "'It was quite an accident that he stopped at Laufingen at all,' she said. "'He was going on to Italy.' "'Caffin did not give up even then. "'He tried one last probe. "'Of course,' he said. "'I forgot. "'Your husband kept him so completely in the dark about it all, eh, Mark? "'Well, when you got him to come down to Wastwater with me, 
he had no idea what festivities were in preparation had he no my boy said mark with a perfectly natural and artistic laugh i really don't believe he had you mustn't be shocked darling he added to mabel it was all for his good poor fellow i must tell you some day about our little conspiracy it's all very well for you though he turned to caffyn again to put it all on to me you had more to do with it than i it was your own idea you know oh said caffyn well if you like to put it in that way he lost his self-possession completely there was something in all this that he could not at all understand the fact was that mark felt himself able now to face the whole world with equanimity the knowledge that no one would ever detect him made him a consummate actor he had long made up his mind how he would greet caffyn when they met again and he was delighted to find himself so composed and equal to the occasion caffyn stood looking after the carriage as it drove away with them he had quite lost his bearings the paper in holroyd's hand mark's own behaviour in so many instances vincent's rapid pursuit had all seemed to point so clearly to one conclusion yet what was he to think now he began for the first time to distrust his own penetration he very much feared that his elaborate scheme of revenge was a failure that he must choose some other means of humbling mabel and must begin all over again which was a distressing thought to a young man in his situation he was glad now that he had never talked of his suspicions and had done nothing openly compromising he would not give up even yet until he had seen holroyd and been able to pump him judiciously until then he must bear the dismal suspicion that he had overreached himself one of his shafts at least had not fallen altogether wide for as mark and mabel were being driven home across the park she said suddenly so harold knew that vincent was alive then yes said mark he knew and he looked out of the window at the sunset as he spoke and you and harold kept him from hearing of our wedding she said mark i thought you said you had told him oh no said mark you misunderstood there there were reasons tell me them said mabel well said mark vincent was ill any one could see that what he wanted was rest and that the fatigue and and the excitement of a wedding would be too much for him caffyn wanted a companion up at wastwater and begged me to say nothing about your marriage just then and leave it to him to tell him quietly later on that's all darling i don't like it dear said mabel i don't like your joining harold in a thing like that i know you did it all for the best but i don't see why you could not have told him if he was not well enough to come to the wedding we should have understood it perhaps you're right said mark easily but at all events no harm has come of it to anybody how they are thinning the trees along here aren't they just look down that avenue and mabel let him turn the conversation from a subject she was glad enough to forget End of chapter thirty five